Hello and salam everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I am super excited to be here with you. Uh, my name is Melody Moisey. I'm an Iranian-American Muslim bipolar feminist author, attorney, activist, and a professor of creative writing here in the US where I live in the state of North Carolina. So I mention all of these identities, Iranian-American, Muslim, bipolar, all of them, uh, not because any specific one of them defines me by itself by any stretch, but because all of these identities are relevant to what I write and why I write, uh, which is relevant to why I'm speaking with you right now. So, and that's namely because creative writing for me has been a powerful tool throughout my life to heal, to grow, and to transform. Uh, and reading as well has been that for me. Uh, and I, I know that I'm not alone. I've met plenty of other people for whom this is the truth. Uh, and I genuinely believe that all of us can benefit from recognizing this. But I think it's especially important for healthcare workers and patients because they're dealing with disease and disability uh, on a daily basis, right? And I have been on both sides of this. Uh, I'm not a healthcare worker. I have volunteered uh, teaching writing workshops inside of psychiatric facilities and hospitals. Uh, so I know and I've witnessed patients transform that way. I have been a patient myself in psychiatric hospitals uh, and have found art therapy, whether it was writing uh, or painting or other forms of art, incredibly helpful. Uh, and so, yeah, I've seen both sides of that. And I think to understand where I'm coming from, when I say that writing is a tool for healing and growth and transformation, which sounds, you know, great, wonderful, uh, but what does it actually mean, right? Um, I think it'll help if I share a bit of my story and my perspective on creative writing and life and some other stuff. So uh, I write mostly creative nonfiction. Uh, so that phrase, that label is strange because you hear the word creative, you think oh, are you making up facts and nonfiction is truth. So uh, a bit of a paradox in that uh, label. I'm not sure it's my favorite, but to give you a good distinction in the creative writing world, the difference between creative nonfiction and nonfiction would just be straight reporting, for instance, and then writing uh, essays that are also meant to read really well. And hopefully straight reporting reads really well too, which is why it's a fine line. Uh, but I'm also a lawyer, so I used to write contracts and wills uh, and trusts, and, and that would be definitely not the kind of creative writing we're talking about. Uh, it's creative from a legal perspective. You have to be creative when you're doing that kind of work, but uh, that's not what we mean when we're talking about creative nonfiction. So that's mostly what I write. I've dabbled in fiction, and I'm hoping to do more of that in the future. I also translate poetry. Most recently, I've translated uh, the work of Molana or Rumi, as he's more commonly known in the West, but Molana in Iran uh, and lots of other places. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm, I, I write different things, but really focus a lot on creative nonfiction. So uh, in terms of the topics I write about, I write about Islam, Muslims, uh, particularly Muslims in America uh, and what we're facing and have been facing since 9-11, racism, mental health, disability rights, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, uh, and so on. You get, you get the drift, I'm, I'm hoping. So for me, creative writing is a personal and a political act. And not just that, it's a spiritual practice. Uh, so effectively, as a Muslim, writing is the truest expression of jihad in my life. Uh, and I always have to clarify, because unfortunately in the, in the US and other parts of the so-called Western world, jihad has been consistently mistranslated as holy war. That is not what it means. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that already, but I, I, it's very unfortunate how far and deep that misconception runs. So rather, it just means struggle, a struggle against oppression within ourselves and within the world around us and recognizing in doing both of those things that the more I work to find peace and justice within my own soul, the better the world becomes. And the more I work to find and pursue peace and justice in the world, uh, the better the world becomes. So there are two sides of the same coin, right? And that is basically what my writing is about. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, where he says, the ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr. Uh, and I know this to be true because books have changed my life. They have changed my heart, my soul, every part of my being far more than any martyr ever has, though granted some of the authors I've read 
have become martyrs, uh, not intentionally, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that that idea that the ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr is part of what drives me. The notion uh, there's another hadith when the Prophet Muhammad said, uh, peace be upon him, says that uh, the mo the greatest jihad, the highest jihad, is to speak truth in the face of an unjust leader, uh, and that's what I'm doing with my writing. I'm trying to speak truth in the face of injustice wherever I find it, uh, and so basically, I'm a writer because I'm an activist. I'm an activist because I'm Muslim and vice versa. <laughs> um, it, that speaks to me, this idea of seeking justice in the world, um, which is, you know, partly why I became a lawyer and pursued that line of work, because I thought, if you're interested in social justice, of course, you go, you know, you go to law school, that, that's what you do. Uh, but it turned out to be not the best route for me. There are plenty of lawyers who do amazing work, uh, and God bless them for doing it. Uh, it just wasn't the best route for me. And to give you a little bit of how I got there, uh, I was very much born to be an activist. I was born in 1979, the year of the so-called Islamic Revolution uh, in Iran. And I was born here in the United States, but my family, we were kicked out shortly thereafter uh, during the hostage crisis. Uh, when the hostages were taken, they destroyed a lot of uh, the students destroyed a lot of documents. And my parents' documents were among those documents uh, in the embassy. And yeah, so we had to leave and we lived in Greece and France and back in Iran for a while. And then the Iran Iraq war started. Uh, so it was not a great place to be. So we eventually made it back to the United States. And I grew up mostly in Dayton, Ohio, which is uh, it's a city, but it's sort of a small town in the middle of America uh, and was actually a great place for me to grow up. We had a pretty diverse population and actually a lot of Iranian immigrants. So I had a community growing up, which was great. Uh, and started as an activist very young. I staged my first protest when I was seven years old uh, to get the ice cream truck to come to our neighborhood. Um, the man who drove the truck and sold the ice cream and played the music and everything like that uh, came to all the neighboring neighborhoods so we could hear them. And we would, we would never be able to make it to the truck to get ice cream on time, which I thought was a human rights violation <laughs> at seven years old, uh, and gathered sort of the neighborhood stakeholders, which were, uh, it's, it's a very small neighborhood at the top of a hill, and, and we tried to get the ice cream man, so it was very few of us, maybe three, and tried to get the ice cream man to come to our neighborhood. And he did, so I was successful in that, and that was probably my greatest success as an activist in terms of the time it took from my goal to reaching my goal, uh, which was about a week. Uh, after that, I took on tougher causes. I pursued human rights work. I started an Amnesty International chapter in my high school in Dayton and then pursued it into college. And like I said, then decided I wanted to be a lawyer because that made sense for someone like me who was so deeply interested in justice, right? Uh, the problem with the practice of law in a lot of places, and initially I wanted to do international human rights law. Uh, it's very difficult to enforce international human rights law. Uh, and you have to be prepared to fail for a lot. You have to be prepared to, you have to be patient. And I am just deeply not patient. As a person, I am not a patient person. Uh, so I just realized it wasn't for me, but at the same time, that education has informed my writing and I'm very glad and I'm licensed as an attorney and I'm happy to be and I'm grateful for the education uh, because it informs my writing and my life, right? And uh, I'm glad that it was a different path than most people take, I guess, to come to writing, but it was the path I took and I'm, I'm happy that it, uh, that it was available to me. And that basically meant I wrote my first book while I was in law school. Um, and that book is called War on Air, Real Stories of American Muslims. Um, and that was published shortly after I graduated law school. And the point of that, the title you get, War on Air, Real Stories of American Muslims, was this error throughout the United States and the so-called West that Muslims were terrorists. Um, and that was, so I was fighting the discrimination against Muslims, commonly known as Islamophobia, but what has led to wars, what has led to innocent Muslims all over the world dying for no good reason. Uh, so that was the point of my first book. Uh, and with that book, I realized very quickly that there is a power to writing to be able to change people's minds in a way that you can't 
you can't do with the law. At least you can't do it that quickly, right? So with writing, once you change somebody's mind, then you have them for life, right? You can change the law. It doesn't mean people will follow the law, right? And, and certainly in the South here in the U.S., we know that very well. And throughout the United States, voter suppression, for instance, is a really big issue. Um, doesn't mean people will follow the law, including the people at the top of your governments. Doesn't mean they will follow the laws. And we have seen that all over the world, not just in the United States. But uh, recognizing that pretty quickly and recognizing that the kinds of people who were contacting me after that book was published were telling me that, you know, it changed them in some way. There were Muslims who were contacting me. I wrote about it. two LGBTQ Muslims uh, and got messages from Muslims, uh, queer Muslims from all over the world saying that it helped them to know that they weren't alone. And that, a lot of my writing revolves around that, this notion of that we're not alone. Um, and it, it evolves out of this notion of loneliness that I think a lot of us who are living between worlds tend to face and this hope for community. And so my second book, which was a memoir about having bipolar disorder, uh, which I have, I have bipolar type one. Uh, that book is called Haldol and Hyacinth, A Bipolar Life. And in that book, I was fighting discrimination against people with mental health conditions uh, like me. Uh, because I realized quickly after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder that the stigma surrounding this condition was unconscionable. And not just stigma, but direct discrimination. Uh, here in the US, our largest mental health facilities are jails and prisons. Uh, we use solitary confinement here more extensively than any other country on the planet, and we use it for treatment and for punishment. Despite the fact that it's been proven, it works for neither and actually makes things worse. Uh, I, I was held for a day in solitary, which they have all these other words for it. They're these euphemisms of isolation, seclusion, there's a lot of them, uh, but it's cruel, it's unusual, it's torture as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, part of writing that book was to fight the discrimination against people like me who have mental health conditions. My most recent book is a memoir about learning Rumi's poetry from my father and fighting discrimination all, on all fronts, uh, fighting all, all kinds of injustice and hatred and ignorance, which I'd been doing for so long, but I'd been doing from this perspective of anger instead of love. Uh, and so that book, threw me a prescription, sorry, I didn't show it to you. Uh, that's it. Uh, changed every, I mean, the living of that book changed everything for me because as an activist and as a writer, I was able to write from a perspective of love in a way I hadn't before. And psychologically, that was <laughs> really vital. Um, and spiritually, it was really vital for me to get to that point. So all of this to say, my goal in writing is deeply linked to jihad, meaning I try to grow spiritually, to heal and to transform not just myself, but my readers, right? The society I live in, hopefully to make it more just and more compassionate on every level. But when you're writing to grow and to transform and heal uh, in a society where you're a a so-called minority, uh, there are unique challenges to that, right? Uh, in my case, I faced publishers and editors uh, and plenty of folks who were basically telling me constantly uh, in a society that was constantly telling me that, you know, as an Iranian, as a Muslim, as a person with a disability, uh, your stories are not accessible. They are not relatable. And I worked very hard not to internalize that because it's very easy to internalize it and to think my story doesn't matter. Um, and you know, the, a word like accessibility, it's a great term uh, and a great idea in the disability context, uh, not so much in the cultural context, right? So you think of accessibility, you think of accommodations, you think of ramps and interpreters and closed captioning and service animals and all of these wonderful things that in the US were guaranteed under the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? Uh, but when these publishers and editors were telling me in this broader context of your writing is not accessible, what I learned was this was code. This meant it's not white, it's not male, it's not Christian, it's not neurotypical. And if you're going to write from that perspective, uh, society and broad, like publishing, what I found is what they wanted me to do was feed into the stereotypes that already existed about my own people. Uh, and I refused. And maybe, you know, I'm not as successful as a writer <laughs> financially, 
uh, because of it, but I know that it made me a better writer and it made me a better person to refuse to do that. And just to give you an idea of how deeply entrenched this is, um, with my first book, War on Error, about young Muslim Americans, I had two big publishers who were interested in my agent at the time, who thankfully is not now <laughs> my agent, um, pitched it to these publishers and, and they liked my writing and they said, this is great, uh, but just come back to us. You've written about a dozen young Muslim Americans. Now add one more Muslim American who's a terrorist. Um, and as I mentioned, the whole point of the book was to fight the stereotype that Muslims are terrorists that unfortunately is so strong uh, in the United States even still. And so I said that, obviously, I said, no, what are you talking about? And they said, we don't want to publish it. Um, so I ended up going with a small academic press uh, and uh, dropped my agent, who at that point said to me, you know, even before she said, oh, of course you should interview a terrorist. By the way, like this whole idea that I know a terrorist, like that I can find a terrorist to interview was horrifying to me, right? Um, or that I would want to, you know, and, and that's just not, I, I, this was my introduction into publishing, right? So um, the agent, and that after all of this, not only did the agent suggest I do what they were asking me to do, even though, of course, I didn't know any terrorists and didn't want to do it, and it was the opposite of the point of the book, um, she also said to me, you know, it would be good for you and for your career if you converted to Christianity. And that's when I was, that's when I cut the relationship. Um, I did a mutual rescission of contract uh, and have never heard from her again and I've never con contacted her again. Uh, and was happy to go with that small press. But as a writer, you know, like I wanted to be successful. I wanted to make a living doing this and that was not the way to do it. Um, as much as I loved that small academic press, it, that wasn't a way to make a living. So with my next book, which was, again, a memoir about having bipolar disorder, then I, I thought, you know, I've had, a, I've had some success with the first book and, and was able to sell it to a big publisher. My, I had a new agent, a wonderful agent who I still have, uh, who was able to sell it to a big publisher. And this was the book that I wished existed when I had been diagnosed with bipolar because there was no book by a Muslim, no memoir that I could read by a Muslim man or woman uh, or gender non-conforming Muslim, anybody. Like there's no m memoir that I could read. And I, I write memoir I, and I love to read it. Uh, and there wasn't anything like that. There wasn't uh, anything by an Iranian by any stretch and I couldn't find anything by a Middle Easterner. <laughs> like, I, it was very hard to find because in our communities, we tend to be very quiet about mental health issues, uh, which unfortunately breeds a lot of shame. And for me, I found out very quickly that the most debilitating part of having a mental health condition like bipolar disorder isn't the illness itself. And I, I mentioned I have the most severe form of this condition. If I don't take my medication properly, I have hallucinations, I have delusions, it's serious. But that is not nearly as disabling as the stigma and the discrimination surrounding these conditions. Uh, that's what's so disabling. The shame is so disabling. The silence is so disabling. And, and the point about the silence is that like no one ever told me to be ashamed at all. And I, I have personally, in my background, never been ashamed, as I'm sure you can tell. I've not been ashamed to be Iranian. I'm, I've never been ashamed to be American. I've never been ashamed to be Muslim, no matter how deeply politically inconvenient that has become in my life. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to be a woman. Like None of these things have I ever been ashamed of, but this was the first time in my life that I felt myself ashamed of something, and it was entirely because of the way society viewed it, not because of what it was. Um, and the message I got was be quiet about it, especially, you know, within our communities, we tend to be told to be quiet about things like this within Muslim communities, within Persian and Iranian communities, particularly. Uh, and I wanted to change that. So that, that was the point of that book. And I was hoping I could be able to do that with that book. Uh, because at the end of being diagnosed, I was told sort of, I guess at the tail, I, I was in two separate psychiatric facilities. I was diagnosed after an acute manic episode and a psychotic break. So it was a fairly easy diagnosis because I had a long history of depression before that. So now there was mania and depression. So it was a clear 
cut case at that point of bipolar disorder, but I remember leaving one of these facilities and there was a healthcare provider, and this is, I think, important because I know I'm speaking to a lot of healthcare providers and also patients and all sorts of people, but it's important to be aware that what you say matters, right? Um, and this woman who had never met me before in my life and had some file open in front of her, which could have been mine or not, as, as far as I knew, and she looked at me and the first thing she said to me was, you need to lower your expectations for your life. And at this point, this is where I am deeply grateful to have been raised by these wonderful Iranian immigrant parents who have always taught me to expect more of myself, even and especially when the rest of the world expected less of me, right? Um, whether it was because of my gender, my disability, my religion, whatever reason people could think less of me, then I, I knew that that wasn't a valid reason. So because of my parents and my upbringing, I was very lucky that when she said, lower your expectations for your life, I didn't. I looked at her and I said, girl, raise yours, because I'm not about to lower mine. And I didn't, I refused to do it. And thank God, right? But I worry about the people who are given the same diagnosis and don't have the wonderful supportive family I have and weren't raised to, to know that this is garbage, that you shouldn't be ashamed of these parts of your identity. Uh, or God forbid any sort of health condition, right? I had a pancreatic tumor when I was a teenager. I, I was never ashamed of that, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I was never encouraged to be ashamed of that. So um, with this book as well, I faced the same thing. Um, so this is an Iranian, American, Muslim, bipolar, feminist uh, memoir. And the argument from publishers and editors was like, this is unrelatable. You know, you know how many Iranian, American, Muslim, bipolar feminists are there? Uh, which shouldn't matter because I've read so much literature about people who are different than me that has changed me. People who are so different from me in terms of identity because what connects us is our hearts and our souls, right? And that's not different. Uh, and I knew that, but it, it was hard being in a, in a system and in a society that didn't recognize it. Uh, so in any case, same thing, inaccessible, unrelatable. Thankfully, we were able to find a publisher to publish it. Um, and the same, and I've, I've faced this notion of being inaccessible and unrelatable with all of my books. With my most recent book, uh, I was told that, you know, nobody knows who Rumi is, uh, <laughs> which is hilarious. In, in the U.S., nobody knows. Well, he's supposedly the best-selling poet in the United States in, in translation, often in mistranslation, uh, but even still, right, people do know who, who Rumi is, and even if they don't, they should, right? Who, who is to say your Shakespeare is so wonderful, and, and he's great, but I think you compare Shakespeare to Rumi, and it's no comparison, right? So, and I mean, there is no comparison to someone like Molana, right? But so many Westerners actually don't, aren't familiar with him outside of Instagram, right? And outside of a whole lot of misinterpretations that wipe Islam away from it. And that's what I was told. I was told, why do you keep talking about how he's Muslim? Uh, it doesn't matter that he's Muslim. He's, he loves everyone. And I said, yes, of course he loves everyone. But right now, a lot of people hate Muslims and for no good reason. And maybe if they knew that Rumi, who they love on Instagram is Muslim, <laughs> maybe they wouldn't feel that way in the same, it wouldn't be as easy, regardless. It wouldn't be as easy for them to feel that way. And I, I think it's important to keep people in their historical context. Uh, so, and you know, that's my background. That's my culture. That's where I come from. Those are my roots. Uh, as Rumi says, that's my reed bed, right? That's where I come from. And of course, the ultimate reed bed that we all come from is the divine, right? So that none of this should matter because the things, again, that connect us are our hearts and souls. So um, that is where relatability comes from, right? So what I think and what's become really important for me is to, is to recognize there is this rampant delusion in this world about, and, and I, I don't wanna just throw publishing under the bus, like it's not just publishing, but the whole, all of our society in healthcare as well, I saw it consistently that like your story isn't as important, isn't as valid, isn't as accessible, isn't as relatable, isn't something we can necessarily help you with, you know? Um, and one, that's not true, and, and being able to say that's not true, and being able to do that and write from my experience authentically, 
has helped enormously. And I, I genuinely believe that the only way that you can heal and grow and transform through your writing and through any form of art is to be authentic with it, right? Uh, because we are the experts in our own stories. Uh, whether those are related to having a disability, right? I'm the expert in my own story. I don't need you to tell me what it's like to have bipolar disorder. I don't need you to tell me what it's like to be an Iranian. Uh, even though, you know, I've had editors who try and say, no, it should be like this, it should be like that. No, I know what it's like. I live it. Uh, so no one is more qualified than us to tell our own stories. And we all have stories that are worth telling, that are valuable, and don't let anybody tell you they're not. Uh, we, no matter what our background is, no matter what our disability status, our nationality, our religion, there are certain stories that only you can tell, right? There, there are stories that you have that nobody else can tell. And what I wanna encourage you to do is tell those stories because those are your best stories. Those are the stories that will not only transform you and your readers, uh, they will transform the world, right? That's how books change the world. They were, that's why dictators all over the world are terrified of writers. Uh, that's why they ban our books, you know, because words matter and they change us and they change the planet we're living on. Uh, so tell those stories, tell those stories that only you can tell and I promise you will never go wrong. So, to that end, uh, I have a couple prompts I've created to help encourage you to tell your stories uh, through writing. And your responses can be in the form of creative nonfiction or anything else. They can be poetry, they can be fiction, uh, or some hybrid. But again, I want you to be telling those stories only you can tell. And, and you have them, I promise you have them. Um, and if the prompts lead you somewhere completely far afield, somewhere that you're like, this isn't even answering that prompt anymore, I don't care, even better. Let it take you where it takes you. Go where the writing takes you. The purpose of this prom these prompts and any prompts is not to confine you or limit you, but to inspire you and to liberate you so you can write those stories that only you can write and ultimately grow, heal, and transform as a writer, as a human being, and help us do the same as your readers. Uh, so here we go to the prompts. Uh, the first prompt is, uh, and they should be, I think, somewhere, I'm looking all over, like, where would they be? They would be maybe down up, somewhere around this page that you're on. Uh, you should be able to find them and read them, and that is the first one. They're related. So the first one is, write about your own experiences or that of a character, system, or community dealing with what society recognizes as a so-called physical or organic disease or disability. Again, this can be fiction, creative nonfiction, poetry, or a hybrid. Uh, so that is the first prompt. The second prompt is the same, but talking about so-called mental or psychiatric diseases and disabilities. Uh, so remember, tell the stories only you can tell. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you in the next two clips. Take care. Hello and salam and welcome back. Uh, this is Melody Moisey again, uh, talking to you about using writing to grow and heal and to transform ourselves, one another, and the world we live in, inshallah, right? Um, <laughs> the first prompt is what we're going to address today. Uh, and just as a reminder, that prompt was write about your own experience or that of a character system or community dealing with what society recognizes as a so-called physical or organic disease or disability. Uh, and just to review, there is no one right way to answer uh, or to deal with any sort of creative prompt. It's not like math, uh, which is good and bad. There's no one universal right answer, right? Uh, and the point of these prompts is to liberate us and uh, not to limit us. So just keep that in mind throughout. There are no formulas when it comes to writing. When there are, it gets boring. Uh, and personally, I generally don't do outlines when I write. Um, for, for all of my books, I've had outlines, really general outlines that would have been even more general if it weren't for the fact that as a nonfiction writer, uh, I sell my books before I've written all of them, and most publishers want to see, uh, you know, if you are only giving a sample chapter, they want an outline. They want to see what the book's going to be about. That said, often my books don't match perfectly with a proposal and that's fine because the writing takes me somewhere else that I needed to go and I just didn't know I needed to go there until I actually started writing it. So that's entirely fine and expected and 
I just want to say that I've, you know, I've written three books and countless essays, hundreds at least. Uh, I have not kept track, but every single time I sit down to write an essay, uh, it feels like the first time. It feel, I mean, it feels like I've never done this before. <laughs> it feels like I'm entering a new planet. And th I mean, that's why I keep doing it, honestly, is because I enjoy, I enjoy that um, rush. And it, but it's also, it, it can induce terror. And it's done that before too, um, where you know, I'm just terrified that I, you know, I might not be able to do this. But so far, every time I've been able to do it. So point being, do not let that level of fear push you away. And often when you're afraid of writing about something or talking about something, that's often where we need to go uh, as artists. That's how we grow. And as human beings, that's how we grow and that's how we heal, uh, is to go to those places that scare us uh, and to do it responsibly, right? There's certain things that might unnecessarily traumatize you. You might not be ready to write about something for a while, and that's entirely fine. Just be aware of that as you're writing. Um, and as you're approaching the writing and just be merciful and kind to yourself in doing that. So all of that said, um, I, just, I just want you to not let any sort of fear stifle you. Uh, and when I say, you know, I often start writing about one thing and it turns into something else. Like my, as an example, my most recent book, uh, The Rumi Prescription, started off, I, I thought I'm gonna write a book about Persian Sufi poetry. Uh, and then I narrowed it down to maybe just about Rumi. And then as I was learning Rumi, who my dad was teaching me uh, this poetry, then I, I realized it was more about my dad and his love for Rumi. Uh, and then as I was living through learning this poetry of my own ancestors um, that really spoke to me in a lot of ways, I then realized the book was about my relationship with my father and how, how Rumi uh, brought us together and how his love for Rumi helped me fall in love with Rumi. Uh, or Molana, uh, as much as he loves them, almost as much. My dad's a huge fan. So uh, in any case, it started off being about one thing and ended being about something else. And that's how all of my books have gone. So uh, not something to run away from. Uh, in terms of this specific prompt, I will say that my life has been this prompt, um, this and the second prompt that we'll get to. Uh, and that's because my connection to what society recognizes as a so-called physical or organic disease uh, or disability is deeply personal because uh, I, at a young age, I was a teenager. I had a rare pancreatic tumor that nearly killed me. And that was the first thing that I chose to write about. Uh, and as a writer and a person with a disability at that time, physical, Part of me giving you these two prompts together is to say what we recognize as physical and psychological are connected. Uh, you can't separate them. Uh, so it was a bit of a trick. Like you're gonna figure out that when you start writing about the physical, you're actually writing about the psychological. And when you write, start writing about the psychological, you're actually also writing about the physical. Uh, these things are connected. You can't separate them. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way the healthcare system tries to separate them is, is if like our brain was we're not attached to our bodies, uh, but no, our brains are attached to our bodies um, and all of that is deeply connected. So one other reason you might find yourself veering in other directions, and again, that's entirely fine. Uh, so let me go to, uh, in terms of how I responded to this, I ended up publishing a piece about my experience with this tumor uh, and largely about the American healthcare system in the Yale Journal for Humanities and Medicine. Uh, and it's important for me to focus on humanities and medicine because that is something that we don't often, um, we don't often, we don't put those two things together often, right? And they belong together on so many levels uh, because the arts in general, like have helped me as a patient and a human being so much. And in many cases, more than any pharmaceutical um, and not to say, you know, I'm not against pharmaceuticals, but these things are helpful to patients. They're therapeutic. They have a purpose and there's data to show that. So um, this isn't just, you know, some frou-frou, woo-woo kind of stuff. This is, there's actual solid data to show that writing about your experiences can help you get through them. And certainly that was my case, the case with this piece. So I am going to share my screen with you and there should be a link to this essay uh, but I'm going to share it on the screen as well to make it easier for you. Uh, and 
here you go. There it is, share. Good, so you should be looking at it and let's hope I'm looking at it as well. Uh, so this is again, the, the title of the essay that I wrote is called Half a Pancreas Later, Some Things Are Hard to Digest. Uh, the surgeons removed half of my pancreas. So uh, just the first paragraph, let's get into it. Lying in a sterile hospital bed, complete with wheels on the bottom and metal bars on the sides, I could no longer disregard the pressing demands of my relentlessly contracting and expanding bowels. The term evacuation once conjured images of large masses fleeing fires or hurricanes or nuclear disasters, blocking exits in major roadways. No longer. Now images of the mess most messy and unavoidable consequences of human life have come to replace them. Images of excretion, humiliation, and death. Uplifting, right? <laughs> um, so I share that because beginnings are hugely important to me. Uh, I, when it, as a reader and as a writer, for sure. Uh, I pick up a book and if the first sentence in the first paragraph doesn't grab me uh, and really pull me in, I won't keep reading. So it's important to me as a writer to have very strong beginnings. And I have spent incredibly long periods of time working on uh, the beginnings of books and essays. Uh, and I will also say I find the beginnings the, to be the hardest part. Uh, so sometimes I'll start writing um, knowing this isn't going to be the beginning of the essay, uh, but just to get started writing because there's so much pressure for me. And I, I, pressure is not the best thing for a writer, but I, I feel so much pressure because beginnings are so important to me. So I rarely start there, uh, which brings me to how I actually did start this, uh, this, this essay in this piece. Uh, lying in a sterile hospital bed, right? Uh, immediately when you read that, you think, why are you in a hospital bed? <laughs> uh, what's happening? And, and you can, so this idea of pulling somebody in, uh, one way of doing that is starting in media rest, or, which is Latin for in, in the middle of things, right? It's a narrative technique of starting in the middle of a story. And you'll notice a lot of essays, a lot of books, a lot of uh, writing starts that way. Uh, and that doesn't mean that's the only way to start it, but for me, often that's how it ends up. Uh, and other ways to sort of, it is one way to pull the reader in quickly uh, because it starting in the middle means there's a lot of questions and the, the reader immediately has all those questions and wants them answered. Uh, and other ways, you know, in terms of grabbing readers' attention early and really getting them to keep reading would be provocative statements or imagery. Um, in this case, the contracting and expanding bowels, um, somewhat repulsive, but uh, my readers who, you know, I have a dark sense of humor, who connect with that would connect with that. Uh, so there's also a matter of the, the part about starting in the middle allows you to build some suspense, right? It allows you to get your reader asking questions and take them uh, toward a place where, where those questions are answered. So. Uh, another issue when we're dealing with um, prompts like this in, in writing about whether it's physical disability or, or psychiatric disability, again, these things are deeply connected uh, in that it's a false dichotomy to separate them. Uh, so apologies for having done that in this, but that's the way the world does it. That's the way the world separates disease and disability. It's almost, these are the, I think the physical and the so-called psychiatric, the the visible and the invisible uh, as well, right? So one of the things you need to consider is whether if you're, particularly if you're writing creative nonfiction about yourself, and even if you're writing fiction, because often there, there is fiction that is written uh, autobiographically, um, and then is written as fiction to protect the writer in some ways or protect certain characters, uh, you need to decide how much you're gonna disclose. And as a writer, you always need to decide how much you're gonna disclose. but and, and what you're gonna disclose. And I think it's a little different when you're dealing with a disability that's your own. Uh, when you're dealing with a disability that's somebody else, that is somebody else's, that is a whole different ball game. We'll get into talking about that. Uh, but I will say uh, in, in the next uh, clip, but when you're writing about somebody else's disability, be aware uh, and do your research. Uh, because when I said we are the experts in our, own experiences and we are uniquely qualified to tell certain stories. Uh, th those are our stories that we're uniquely <laughs> qualified to tell. So it's dangerous and not to say that you can't 
write other people's stories. But if you're doing so, you need to do so from an informed perspective. Uh, and to recognize, especially if you're starting out writing, this may not be your best story. Your best story is the one that you know best, that, that connects with you the most. Um, and again, that might be a story you're afraid to write. And that might be why you're trying to write somebody else's story. Uh, eventually, you'll find your own sort of master narrative. That there are things that you will keep writing um, if you continue writing. Uh, and for me, this connection to disability and what happens when the mind and the body break down uh, has been part of my master narrative. Uh, and maybe that's a master narrative that changes every decade, you know, uh, but it's something that you come back to. Uh, and I certainly have found myself coming back to it. But the questions of disclosure and how much um, in doing what serves both you and the story best, right? These are, these are hard things because as a writer, often you're told, uh, do what serves the story best, do what serves, in this case, the essay best uh, or the book best. That's not always going to be what serves you psychologically <laughs> best. Often it will. And there is, when I talk about writing being therapeutic, that's what I mean. Uh, but there are moments where it won't be what serves you best. So one of the most important things uh, you have to do as an artist in any field, whether you're a writer or a sculptor or anything else, is to be self-aware, to know what is pushing you too far, when you need to say, I need to step back from this. Uh, that's a hard thing to know, um, especially when you find yourself in, in flow. But you need to recognize that this work is psychological, it's spiritual. Um, and it can be exhausting. And, and to, to recognize that at the same time that you're recognizing that it can be liberating and therapeutic, it can also hurt you in some ways. So um, trying to minimize that and, and stick to the points where it'll help you grow and heal and transform in all the best ways uh, and not push yourself into situations narratively that you're not quite ready for. Uh, and and often I think what helps when you're in that kind of situation is to read, um, not so that you can steal somebody else's uh, format, structure, content, anything else, but to, to read, to get ideas of how, how other people are relating to this and to get an idea about how the way you relate to it is unique and what you're adding to it. Uh, so I hope that you found some of this helpful. Uh, I look forward to hearing from some of you, inshallah, in the future about how you address this prompt. Obviously, you, I'm sure you addressed it differently than I did, and that's the way you should address it. Um, you probably didn't have a rare benign pancreatic tumor that nearly killed you. Um, so yeah, uh, I look forward to hearing from you. All of my contact information should be somewhere on this page. Um, if it's not, you can find me on Twitter, or Facebook, or anywhere else. Uh, in the meantime, Take care of yourselves, and I'm hoping to see you with the second clip. Uh, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hello and salam again. This is Melody Moisey once again talking to you about using writing to grow, to heal, and to transform ourselves in the world around us. Uh, today I'll be addressing the second prompt, uh, and that prompt reads as follows. It should be somewhere on this page as well, so you can follow along. Uh, write about your own experience or that of a character, system, or community dealing with what society recognizes as a so-called mental or psychiatric disease or disability, as opposed to the first prompt, which was about, uh, which was the same prompt, but in reference to a so-called physical or organic disease or disability. And as I noted last time, these cannot be separated. This is a false dichotomy that our society creates. Uh, between what's psychological and what's physical, because obviously what's physical affects the psychological and vice versa. Um, in any case, as a reminder with this and with all prompts, uh, the purpose of a prompt like this is again to inspire and to liberate you uh, as opposed to limit you and to confine you. So again, go where the writing takes you, tell those stories only you can tell, uh, follow that. And if it's far afield from what you think the prompt is about, that's entirely fine. If that's what you've already done, great. If that's what you end up doing, even better. All right, so uh, moving forward with how my process in terms of how I address this prompt, or more precisely, the, how I address my life, which was this prompt, uh, both for the physical side of things and the 
the psychological side of things, again, both of these things being deeply connected. Uh, last time I referred to a piece I wrote for the Yale Journal for Humanities and Medicine called uh, Half a Pancreas Later, Some Things Are hard, Still Hard to Digest. Uh, and you're welcome to read that if you haven't already or to pause or if you want to read it, it's not mandatory uh, by any stretch. But this time I'm talking about a piece that actually connects directly back to that, uh, that I wrote about a dozen years later for the New York Times called A Persian in Therapy, uh, which would have been a response to this prompt. Uh, and I want to share that piece with you in full because it's a shorter piece. And like I said, it refers back to the first piece as well. So it connects nicely. Uh, so let me share my screen with you and good, that should be done. You should be able to see that with me. Uh, and we can read this together or you, if you don't want to listen to me reading it, you're welcome to pause and listen to it yourself. So here goes a Persian in therapy. My people don't do psychotherapy. We have friends, we have families, we have pharmacies. Paying strangers to listen to our problems isn't our style. I'm Persian, made in Iran, pre-revolution, born in America, mid-revolution, bred in Ohio, post-revolution. I place trust in signs, in duty, in divinity, things that psychotherapists often dismiss as incidental, if not superstitious, or worse yet, symptomatic. The couch is not the place for me. But I had little choice. My first hallucinations appeared in college, which would have been unremarkable had it not been for the dearth of drugs in my system. As a relatively good Muslim girl who didn't even drink alcohol, let alone experiment with hallucinogens, I knew something was wrong. It had been easy to chalk up many of my earliest manic and depressive symptoms to adolescent moodiness or too much Morrissey or an artistic spirit, but not the hallucinations. They freaked me out. Worse, I was already suffering from another illness. A few years before, a tumor had taken up residence in my pancreas and was busy wreaking its own havoc. I had lost count of all the emergency room visits and hospitalizations. Doctors insisted that I maintain a brutally low-fat diet and that ignoring their advice could cause extreme pain, pancreatitis, and even death. I used to joke that I could commit suicide by eating a jar of peanut butter, though eventually this idea became less comic relief and more morbid obsession. That was when I first sought psychotherapy. It didn't go particularly well. Despite weekly therapy sessions on and off over the course of a decade, not to mention countless consultations with psychiatrists, my condition was consistently misdiagnosed as unipolar depression, and thus I was often prescribed medications that exacerbated my condition. All the while, psychothera psychotherapy felt foreign to me. It was, like a wool it was like an overpriced, undersized sweater woven entirely from steel wool. I desperately wanted it to fit and soften with wear, but it did neither. Once, after I mentioned efforts to pray more, a psychologist suggested doing so would be excessive, having assumed, incorrectly, that I already prayed five times a day. I grew skeptical. Perhaps I wasn't sufficiently Americanized to benefit from therapy. Perhaps there was too, just too much Persian pride and pragmatism standing in the way of whatever breakthroughs I was supposed to be making. Perhaps I was terminally displaced, beyond repair. Whatever the case, all the awkward silences, the how does that make you feel, the false cultural assumptions and the utter one-sidedness of the whole psychotherapeutic exchange combined to form a large flashing sign in my mind, you do not belong here. It was just another part of a cultural narrative that didn't include people like me. Eventually, I suffered a psychotic break. This led to a proper diagnosis, bipolar disorder, and better treatment. After being released from the hospital, I found a psychiatrist to manage my medications and vowed to abandon psychotherapy once and for all. I had lost all hope in it. The therapist I'd been meeting with weekly during the year preceding my break told my husband immediately after I was hospitalized that I had a classic and textbook case of bipolar disorder, how she nonetheless managed to miss such a clear-cut case for more than a year remains a mystery. To find my way both spiritually and psychologically, I felt I needed to reclaim my own narrative, in my own words, on my own terms. It's exactly what I'm encouraging you all to do. And somehow get people to listen. It was a gastroenterologist and a fellow writer, not a psychotherapist or psychiatrist, who initially helped me do this. His name was Howard M. Spiro, and he was the first person who believed enough in my writing to publish it. 
The piece was an essay called Half a Pancreas Later, Some Things Are Still Hard to Digest, and it recounted my pancreatic surgery, among other personal misadventures with the American healthcare system. Dr. Spiro find, found a home for it in a publication he had established, the Yale Journal for Humanities and Medicine. For many years, until his death in 2012, he periodically sent me short notes of encouragement after reading something I'd written. His support, personal and professional, helped me begin to heal profound wounds that had seemed impervious to psychotherapy. Then, more than a decade later, something peculiar happened. After moving to another state, I was in the market for a new psychiatrist. I encountered a doctor who did and preferred to do psychotherapy in conjunction with medication management. I liked him. And despite my reservations about psychotherapy, decided to play things by ear, imagining that after a few initial long sessions, we could graduate to routine 15 minute med checks. But during those first sessions, he greatly impressed me. Aside from lodging serious critiques of his own profession, he displayed a remarkable capacity for humor, humility, and humanity. Unlike previous therapists I'd seen, he was not alarmed by my belief that mysticism and mental illness are not mutually exclusive, that there may be value in certain manic or depressive experiences, not as delusions, but as spiritual lessons. He also seemed less obsessed with labels than any of his predecessors. And he managed to say, I don't know, at least a dozen times. I'm not sure I've ever heard another doctor respond to a direct medical question like that. This fact alone earned him my respect. But earning my trust would take more. Given my history, both clinical and cultural, I would need a sign. That's when his first name, that's when his name first struck me, Philip Spiro. The gastroenterologist Howard Spiro was the only other Spiro I had known and he had been so kind and encouraging, inadvertently helping me process so much of the trauma tied to my pancreatic tumor. It seemed only fitting that another Spiro might help me process the trauma tied to my psychiatric condition. I didn't need for the two men to be related. Sharing the same name, the same last name was sign enough for me. So having already made my decision to pursue regular weekly therapy with this new Spiro, I asked him, more out of curiosity than judgment, at the end of one of our early sessions, are you any relation to Howard Spiro at Yale? He was my dad, he replied. And so another sign emerged, complete with flashing lights of its own. Its, mes its message was unmistakable, you belong here. Every Tuesday afternoon since, an entire cultural narrative has shifted slightly, just enough to make room for me, so. So um, getting into, I, I imagine you can tell how these, these two pieces are, are deeply connected, uh, but getting into the reasoning for why one would uh, write an essay like that, why in, that, in terms of structure. Uh, obviously there was something unique and surprising that happened that I wanted to reveal without destroying the suspense of it, right? And there was no way to do that without first telling the story of Dr. Spiro Sr. Uh, and then telling the story of Dr. Spiro Jr. So in this sense, I did start close to the beginning, as opposed to last time when we talked about and many arrests, starting in the middle of things as a narrative technique. The, that's not a rule you need to always follow. That's just something that often happens. Uh, and starting off this piece, uh, it was important for me to establish who I was and why therapy might not be something <laughs> that I rushed toward, right? Uh, and part of that was being able to say, you know, I'm Iranian, I come from a culture where this is not standard, uh, but the way that I said it, being saying specifically, uh, my people don't do psychotherapy. We have friends, we have families, we have pharmacies, paying strangers to listen to our problems isn't our style, right? To start off like that uh, is immediately, gives you a sense of what creative nonfiction is in the first place. We, I was trying to give you, earlier on we were talking about what it, what it is and what it isn't. Um, so if you were to take that sentence literally, my people don't do psychotherapy, that would be inaccurate. There, there's Iranians who do psychotherapy both within and outside of Iran. Uh, but it's not culturally something we generally do, right? So the sentence works. It's simple. My people don't do this. 
except for some do, right? But I could have said many Iranians, it's not part of our culture, this and that, but to say it that concisely, um, it's not lying, it's just putting it in a way uh, that it hits the reader harder. Uh, and and one, of, one of the ways that I chose to do that is a little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> Um, and saying my people don't do this, uh, when the truth is some of them do, but it's not part of our cultural tradition. Uh, I didn't have to say that, right? Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and I read this for you for many reasons. Um, partly because I know many of you work in healthcare, and I want you to know that this in the other essay that we read, um, that if you if you read or not, the essay referenced in this piece as well um are not just essays for me uh writing them became part of my treatment uh that is huge so i don't you don't need to be a writer for something like that to help you you don't that doesn't need to be your profession is what i'm saying uh and i think doing that engaging in the process of writing both of these pieces and the books i've written in between has helped me heal grow and transform as a patient, as a writer, as a person with a disability, as an Iranian American, as a Muslim, and ultimately as a human being. And all of that happened long before any of it was published, right? It didn't require publication. The Yale Journal didn't have to accept it. The New York Times didn't have to accept it for it to work on me, for it to be healing for me, right? So the healing isn't about publication. The healing is about the process of writing and what that can do to somebody's soul and heart and mind. Uh, and for me, everything. It did everything. Um, so I want you, those of you who are in the healthcare profession, and many of us will become patients at some point if we're lucky to live long enough, um, just to recognize this power that writing is a kind of therapeutic tool that is often overlooked. And it's time for us to start viewing it and using it as such, right? Especially in healthcare settings. Uh, I mentioned that I used to teach in a psychiatric facility uh, and teaching those writing workshops was something, you know, I did for free because it helped me. It helped other people. I watched how it helped change other people. I knew that when I was in the hospital, I didn't have the benefit of that sort of thing. And I thought maybe if I can go back and help other people who are in the same situation, it, it could help me. Um, and when I was first diagnosed uh, with bipolar in particular, with all the stigma and the weight that comes with that, uh, I genuinely thought my life was over. I thought I would never be able to accomplish anything of value again. Uh, so to be able to come in and talk to other people and tell them what the system is telling you, what the system is showing you by putting you in isolation, by dehumanizing you, by humiliating you on so many levels with this whole healthcare system that we have here in the US and so many healthcare systems around the world are similar in terms of how they dehumanize patients uh, and, and in so many ways so much worse when it comes to psychiatric care. Um, we need to realize that the messages they're sending us are wrong. We're not wrong. We're not broken. We are not damaged. The systems are broken and damaged. And that's what I was trying to get across in, in uh, both of these pieces, uh, for instance. That the, there are parts of these systems that are broken and damaged, and the, the people who are within them are, are often just victims of them, and we don't have to be. Uh, if we can survive them, we can use art, we can use uh, writing, we can use so many other tactics that aren't directly related to healthcare to help our health, to help us feel better as human beings and to be better, better physically and psychologically. Uh, and I'm a little over time right now, but I do want to leave you with a poem from Molana, uh, where I'll tell you in Farsi and then I'll tell you the translation that I did of it, because uh, I think it speaks to this. And the poem is, it's a couplet. gashti khod avval zarbudi, which means, you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. When I say writing is a way to heal, to grow and transform, 
What I mean is that it's a way for us to reconnect with this gold inside of us, the sacred spark inside of each and every one of us. Because even if we know that the gold is there, and many of us do, the world makes it so easy for us to forget that, especially for those of us who are living with disabilities. Uh, in societies that are constantly dismissing, devaluing, and dehumanizing us uh, and making us feel less than. But by owning and sharing our own narratives through writing, we can stop searching and we can reconnect with the gold that is already within us. So I encourage you to do that. I hope that this masterclass has helped you reconnect with that gold within yourself. And I hope to hear from some of you soon, inshallah. Uh, again, all of my contact information should be somewhere here. And if you can't find it, then you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Uh, thanks so much and be well. Bye-bye.